Item number, SCP-218. Object class, Euclid. Special containment procedures. SCP-218 is contained within a standard aquatic specimen tank, saltwater. Tank maintenance is to be carried out by remote drone only. No further procedures are required. Description. SCP-218 is a predatory colonial organism, weighing approximately 1,800 kilograms, consisting of several hundred parasitic lampreys of the family Petromyzontidae, designated Petromyzon animalis. Individual Petromyzon animalis specimens average between 50 and 90 centimeters in length and are similar in appearance to the common sea lamprey, Petromyzon marinus, with the primary exception of complex ultraviolet spectrum skin patterning. Individual lampreys can break off from the primary mass and move under their own power, acting similar to non-anomalous specimens. These modal units will remain in the vicinity of SCP-218's primary body until captured and eaten by colony members. The central mass of SCP-218 contains the organism's primary organs, as well as a muscular foot for locomotion. SCP-218 is capable of surviving out of the water for up to an hour, though it is greatly inhibited in mobility. Modal units of SCP-218 produce a paralyzing toxin, applied by bite or through the lamprey's mucus sheath. This toxin inhibits locomotor muscles and will numb the target to pain. All other internal and mental processes will continue unaffected. The paralyzing effect has not been observed to dissipate, and no effective counteragent has yet been discovered. Early observation led researchers to believe that SCP-218 reproduced through the parasitic implantation of modal units into a host body. This behavior has since been determined to be atypical feeding behavior, where numerous modal units will burrow within the body of still-living prey for upwards of 48 hours before normal consumption resumes. Addendum 1 Physical examination of SCP-218 shortly after containment revealed that the primary mass contained several foreign objects, preserved within the main body cavity. SCP-218 was removed from its containment tank and tranquilized to allow for surgery. Objects removed from SCP-218 include 33 pearls, averaging 3 centimeters in diameter. Holes bored through each indicate that they were previously part of a necklace. One dolphin figurine carved out of smoothed coral two gold bracelets, four bone hair pins, one tortoise shell hair comb, one bone figurine of SCP-218, shows signs of heavy wear through handling, one human skeleton, being that of a female child, estimated to be between four and six years of age. Skeleton was similar to chalk in consistency and embedded with 135 pearls. Scapula believed to be that of a red deer, engraved with three humanoid figures, two adults, and one child, presumed to be the subject and parents. Both the skeleton and artifacts date to approximately 7500 BCE, though do not resemble the artifacts of other Neolithic groups in the region of recovery. Addendum 2 SCP-218's behavior became significantly more agitated after removal of the aforementioned objects entity would repeatedly beat against the walls of its tank or attempt to scale them. When one of the hairpins was placed back in the containment tank, SCP-218 used one of its colony members as a manipulator to retrieve the pin and then place it back inside its central cavity through the means of a large sphincter. This dorsal sphincter was not present until the removal of the body and artifacts. Item number SCP-244 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures When not in testing, SCP-2441 is to be placed in a room with its own thermostat, kept at a temperature of no less than 38 degrees Celsius. This room must also have its own ventilation system to provide constant air circulation. SCP-2441 will rest on top of a scale attached to an alarm so that any abrupt changes in weight from SCP-2441's cap's sudden removal or from SCP-2441's displacement may be immediately detected. If the alarm goes off, SCP-2441 is to be immediately retrieved, capped, and placed back on the scale. 
In the event that SCP-2441 spends longer than four hours uncapped and active before retrieval is possible, initiate procedure 2442123B. Description SCP-2441 is a Tunisian-style earthenware jar, made of common ceramics mixed with traces of data expunged and decorated with silver filigree. The inside of SCP-2441 always has an internal temperature of negative 37 degrees Celsius and a 125% humidity, regardless of external conditions. Persons handling SCP-2441 invariably describe it as cold to the touch. SCP-2441 includes a cap of identical make and style to the jar itself. When SCP-2441 is uncapped, condensed water vapor will flow from its mouth. The rate at which the vapor emanates increases if SCP-2441 is left lying on its side or suspended upside down. This vapor is identical in composition to ice fog, with a temperature of 37 degrees Celsius and 125% humidity as it exits SCP-2441. Over time, this fog will disperse through whatever area SCP-2441 is in, lowering ambient temperatures and raising humidity levels proportionally. The amount of time it takes for SCP-2441 to fill an area with fog varies depending on the size of the space, the amount of moisture already in the air, and the temperature at the time SCP-2441 is opened. If SCP-2441 is left uncapped outside of any structure, it will still produce water vapor and lower the surrounding temperature. However, the effect may be considerably diminished or enhanced by the effects of the sun, wind, local topography, and or local vegetation. In any space where SCP-2441 has changed the environmental temperature and humidity to negative 37 degrees Celsius and a 125% humidity, there is a chance of encountering SCP-2442 directly proportional to the amount of time that the area has been fogged over. SCP-2442 is a mobile gaseous entity, visible only as a dense cloud of grayish fog. Whether it simply uses SCP-2441's own fog as camouflage, or is actually a part of said fog, is still undetermined. Thermal imaging shows that SCP-2442 is far colder than its surrounding environment. How SCP-2442 achieves locomotion is not known, but testing and observation has made it clear that SCP-2442 usually remains motionless unless there is a source of heat nearby. SCP-2442 is attracted to any source of heat energy and will move to envelop such sources. Because of SCP-2442's own inordinately cold internal temperature, any object that comes into direct contact with it usually flash freezes. Biological heat sources, including humans, are invariably killed by the flash freezing effect, and mechanical or electronic devices ice over. SCP-2442 appears to grow in size as it consumes thermal energy. In a sufficiently large beclouded area, there may be multiple instances of SCP-2442. SCP-2442 will not attempt to consume heat sources with a temperature equal or greater than 600 degrees Celsius, and will actively move away from such sources if they are brought closer to it. For this reason, SCP-2442 is easily repelled with burning wood or other combustive fuel fires. SCP-2442 has been observed to disperse if exposed to great concentrations of heat in a short period of time. History SCP-2441 was first discovered in the basement of a recently emptied Chaos Insurgency-occupied military base, where it had completely filled the basement level with ice fog, and at least two manifestations of SCP-2442. It was retrieved by Dr. Morris with the assistance of Mobile Task Force Beta-62. It is unknown whether the Chaos Insurgency had placed SCP-2441 in the basement as some sort of diversionary tactic, or if they themselves were looking for it. Addendum Whatever SCP-2442 is composed of, it is certainly not normal water vapor. At those temperatures, mere water would surely become a solid, as indeed would most gases. However, Taking samples of SCP-2442's material has proven difficult, 
as it is both gaseous and freezes most devices applied to it. I suspect that this may be related to the data expunged in SCP-2441, but studying that mineral has a host of problems all its own. Dr. Morris Item Number SCP-250 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures SCP-250 is to be kept in a 50 meter by 50 meter enclosure, simulating a prairie environment, with padded steel walls 15 meters high and 1 meter thick. The temperature must remain between 20 and 28 degrees Celsius by day and between 10 and 14 degrees Celsius by night, with an average humidity of no more than 8%. This serves the dual purpose of ensuring that SCP-250's overall behavior remains predictable and of maintaining the physical integrity of its component parts. Vegetation within the enclosure is to be maintained on a weekly basis. Although SCP-250 does not physically require nutrition, it is to be fed one live adult pig every two days in order to regulate its aggression and hunting instincts. The remnants of its meal are to be removed from its enclosure no less than one hour after the onset of its nightly dormancy period. This includes cleaning any residual biological debris from SCP-250's physical components with compressed air and whisk brooms. At no point during cleaning are any of SCP-250's physical components to be moved by more than one meter in any direction, as this risks disrupting its dormancy. Dormancy ends within five minutes of sunrise. Access to SCP-250's containment during its activity period is prohibited. Description SCP-250 is the animate fossil skeleton of an allosaur, originally identified as Allosaurus fragilis. However, an incomplete scientific article found in the personal effects of paleontologist Dr. indicates that this classification may have been erroneous. It consists of 153 disarticulated bones and 14 plaster and fiberglass replacements held together and animated by an unknown force. Study of this force is hindered by SCP-250's aggressive behavior, which has been assessed by Foundation paleozoologists as being well within theoretical norms for an Allosaurus. SCP-250 emulates what are presumed to have been the standard daily activities of a living Allosaurus. It wanders its enclosure by day, enters a state of dormancy by night, and will attempt to kill and devour anything which it perceives as suitable prey, including humans. Its lack of organs does not seem to affect its behavior in any way, except in that the remains of any prey it consumes will inevitably fall out of the gaps in its skull, neck, and ribcage at which point it ignores them. SCP-250 was first excavated as an 80% complete skeleton in 19 Records from the excavation do not include any report of anomalies. Several years later, it was transferred to an undisclosed museum of natural history in where it was assembled, mounted, and put on display. On the night of SCP-250 seized and killed an intruder to the museum. Although damage to the intruder's remains was so extensive as to render forensic identification impractical, they were conclusively shown to not be those of paleontologist Dr. whose office in the museum was extensively vandalized that night and who has not been seen since. Foundation personnel embedded within museum staff reported the incident, and SCP-250 was taken into custody. Item Number SCP-274 Object Class Keter Special Containment Procedures Any buildings found to be infected with SCP-274 are to be reported immediately to a superior and the leader of Mobile Task Force Pi-1, City Slickers. MTF Pi-1 is to incinerate cases of SCP-274-1 and secure the infected buildings by forming a quarantine with a one kilometer radius under the guise of the local police and fire department. MTF Pi-1 is to terminate any cases of SCP-2742 through the use of high pressure fire hoses. Civilians insisting on entering an instance of SCP-2741 are to be detained and have one class B amnestic administered. Any apparatus used to contain or handle SCP-274 should either be incinerated 
or entirely composed of metal or glass and washed thoroughly immediately after use. The cover story for a containment breach of SCP-274 should be gang-related arson. Description SCP-274 is a paint of variable color. Buildings inflicted with SCP-274 appear to have large amounts of graffiti covering the sides of the building and often have large, disturbing designs to them. While its consistency is that of normal paint, its composition reveals it to be 28% hemoglobin, 12% gastric acid, and 60% common components consisted with Krylon brand spray paint. When SCP-274 is applied to a wall, it will begin to spread until it has covered the wall and any walls attached to it. SCP-274 is unable to spread on metal, glass, and horizontal surfaces. While SCP-274 spreads on buildings, it will convert the interior of a wall into a large mesoglea, the interior walls into a gastrodermis, and the exterior walls act as a protective shell and epidermis. Buildings coated entirely with SCP-274 will become cases of SCP-274-1. SCP-274-1 exhibits signs of life, react to stimuli, and behave in a manner similar to many species of the Anthozoa class. Buildings converted into SCP-2741 lure passing civilians by emitting noises from inside SCP-2741. Sounds of glass breaking, loud coughing, or pained whimpers have all been reported from D-Class personnel. It is currently unknown whether SCP-2741 or the SCP-2742s are responsible for this behavior as the noises stop immediately after entry. Typically, civilians will either call the police or investigate the noises themselves. As subjects search inside SCP-2741, they will be recognized as food by instances of SCP-2742, if any are present. When a victim enters a room inside SCP-2741, barring the entryway, they will immediately be suctioned into a gastrovascular cavity belonging to SCP-2741, later processing them into SCP-274 and one instance of SCP-2742. Specimens of SCP-2742 are organisms composed of SCP-274 that appear as men or women wearing a gas mask or respirator, along with a bright pastel-colored hoodie. SCP-2742 is able to support its heavy weight by its thickness and density in its membrane, which consists of 45-50% to of the mass of SCP-2742. SCP-2742 act as nematocysts for SCP-2741 and can disguise themselves by merging into the walls. This is done by heavily compacting themselves and implanting itself into an interior wall, save for their mask, which flattens around the wall and disguises itself as standard graffiti. This behavior has proven to be a means of ambushing food for SCP-2741 and will only react when it detects something it considers a food source. SCP-2742 possesses a hinged operculum that ejects SCP-274 located in the right hand. This operculum looks identical to a normal spray can and can project SCP-274 in a similar manner. SCP-2742 will attempt to spray SCP-274 into the eyes and mouth of its victims in an attempt to incapacitate and encapsulate them. This method of attack has shown to be very painful and will blind and numb the victim from the neck down. Once tagged, the victim is placed into a gastrovascular cavity resulting in a new SCP-2742. SCP-2742 are able to duplicate themselves while inside an instance of SCP-2741 and will produce one new SCP-2742 every 24 hours. Once 12 SCP-2742 specimens reside inside one SCP-2741, further cases of SCP-2742 will leave SCP-2741 and find a new building to spray with SCP-274 while avoiding any people they may encounter. Once a building at least two kilometers away from another SCP-2741 is found, the SCP-2742 will spray SCP-274 onto the building until it has completely dehydrated itself of SCP-274 and dies. 
resulting in another instance of SCP-2741. If left unchecked, it is estimated that SCP-274 could cover a large city within 20 days. Addendum 274 SCP-2741 Appearance Log Date found 01-2001 Appearance SCP-27411 is painted to resemble a large bus with the number on its side. The front of the bus has been replaced by a human-like face and the back is on fire. Bus patrons all look towards the front of the bus and do not seem to react to the fire. Date found 04-2006 Appearance SCP-27412 is painted to look as if it's crumbling apart. At the base, people are illustrated to be running away from SCP-27412 and a face can be seen forming from the falling rubble. Date found 03-2010 Appearance SCP-27413 depicts a beach with three sharks in the water and several people running from the shore. This scene is illustrated behind a large cartoon tiki statue, which takes up most of the front of SCP-27413. Date found 08-2011 Appearance SCP-27414 illustrates what is presumed to be Noah's Ark at sea. The creatures boarding the Ark do not match any known species. The Ark is depicted to have a face with several sharp teeth and eyes devoid of pupils or irises. Date found 11-2011 Appearance SCP-27415 depicts several figures in level 3 biohazard suits at the base. Figures are seen fighting each other for what appears to be a bottle of hand sanitizer. Several cadavers are piled on top of one another in the background, with a large green cloud in the shape of a canine-like face emitting from them. This face is shown laughing, presumably at the people fighting. Date found 07-2012 Appearance SCP-27416 is painted to resemble a mausoleum with a large human skull painted on its front. Illustrated at the base of SCP-27416 are figures suffering from advanced stages of rigor mortis. Most notable is that several figures appear to be wearing the standard issue tactical armor distributed to MTF Pi-1. Date found 08 2012 Appearance SCP-27417 is decorated with the scene of MTF Pi-1 setting SCP-27417 on fire through the use of Molotov cocktails. A large depiction of SCP-2742 can be seen attacking MTF Pi-1. Date found 08-2012 Appearance Data expunged Operatives dead as a result of a large mob of SCP-2742. Item number SCP-280 Object Class Keter Special Containment Procedures SCP-280 is to be contained in a 5x5 meter cell, and no equipment of any kind is to be left inside when staff are not present. Containment area is to be kept in total darkness at all times. Any items taken into the containment cell must be removed by staff at the end of testing, and any staff entering into containment must wear infrared goggles and be equipped with an infrared ID strobe and a strong flashlight. In the event of an SCP-280 attack, all staff are to power on their flashlights and illuminate the subject under attack. No aggressive action is to be taken against SCP-280, and staff are to keep one meter from SCP-280 at all times. Staff should continue to illuminate SCP-280 until it retreats to a sufficient distance to allow the recovery and extraction of the subject of the attack. Description SCP-280 is a black human-shaped mass with two large white eyes on the head and two hands with very long and thin fingers. No feet or legs are visible as the lower portion of the body appears to fade away several centimeters from the ground. SCP-280 appears to be wholly composed of a matter that can gain or lose corporeal form. This matter is very black, with only the eyes showing any other color, and when changing to a non-corporeal form, 
looks much like smoke. The eyes are non-functioning and appear only when SCP-280 is retreating, appearing to be used like eye spots on some insects. SCP-280 is very strong and has been observed pulling apart steel with its hands, showing no sign of stress. SCP-280 moves with a gliding motion, with its hands extended, described as a sleepwalker pose by observers. SCP-280 will move slowly towards any human beings and attempt to attack them. SCP-280 appears to sense human life. No limit has yet been found on this ability. SCP-280 will approach to within 14 centimeters of a subject and then use its hands to pull and tear at the subject, causing massive physical trauma. The attack can last between 1 and 5 minutes and will continue until the death of the subject, at which point SCP-280 will expose its eyes, lose corporeal form, and move to the next human. If no humans are present, SCP-280 will move and ball up against a wall or other structure until a human being is again present. SCP-280 will retreat slowly from light, exposing its eyes in the direction of the light or at any nearby humans. This has been described as extremely disconcerting by those who have been stared at. If the area that SCP-280 currently resides in becomes fully illuminated, or there is a very bright burst of light, SCP-280 will fade away and reappear in another area. This appears to be done purely as a defensive response to light and will not be used to follow or attack prey. SCP-280 does not appear to eat, breathe, or sleep. It does not ingest any of the tissue removed during an attack and simply drops it to tear a new piece. Due to its ability to become incorporeal at will and its aggressive nature, no samples of SCP-280 have been collected. Addendum Notes on Recovery SCP-280 was recovered in Mississippi after several reports of locked room murders and child deaths. All were reported as being extremely vicious, and victims were, quote, horribly mangled. The Foundation became involved after a family of five was murdered in their home. A survivor was found in the basement, nine-year-old David who had come over for a sleepover. He was found in an advanced state of shock, holding a flashlight and unresponsive to outside stimulus. During an investigation of the basement, an officer was attacked and badly mutilated. His statement attracted the interest of Foundation agents. During recovery, SCP-280 was temporarily lost due to its ability to teleport when exposed to high levels of light. It was also observed that SCP-280 is frequently discounted as a shadow when seen in the dark, or dismissed as clothing, hair, or another object when accidentally touched in the dark. When tracking a subject, SCP-280 will remain incorporeal until the moment of attack, causing some to walk very close to or through SCP-280. Subjects report a feeling of dread and unease when inside SCP-280. SCP-280 usually does not respond to this, but will sometimes expose its eyes and enter its retreating posture when passed through. No pattern has emerged for this behavior. Addendum Notes following testing During a series of extensive testing of the effects of various illumination sources on SCP-280's retreat reflex, SCP-280 broke containment. SCP-280 was observed to repeatedly appear and dissipate throughout the illuminated site, progressing through the sublevels, and eventually appearing in SCP-1591's containment chamber. Upon being exposed to SCP-1591, SCP-280 displayed its eyes, but did not retreat. The entity paused and knelt for several minutes before demanifestation. SCP-280 reappeared in its cell several hours later without incident. Item Number SCP-337 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures SCP-337 is to be kept within a steel-reinforced 0.5 meter thick, polished cement containment chamber at all times. Chamber walls must be inspected weekly for cracks and resealed as needed. Access will only be available via two-stage vaulted steel door system with a seal tolerance not to exceed 100 micrometers. 
Antechamber between the doors is to be fitted with multiple remote operated liquid propellant flamethrowers. Both chambers are to be externally monitored with wireless security cameras. Damage or repositioning of cameras should be reported immediately. A self-contained water recycling shower system will be positioned at the far end of the internal chamber. The system's water supply and filters are to be changed on a monthly basis. Personnel assigned to SCP-337 must maintain all head and body hair at no longer than 4 centimeters and will submit to regular full-body inspection to ensure compliance. Any personnel entering the chamber must be escorted by two guards, armed with portable flamethrowers. Following Incident 337-A, Class D personnel involved in testing must be strapped into a restraining gurney and sedated prior to entry. Once per week, one Class D personnel will be stripped of hair measuring longer than 5 centimeters using the Solomon technique. An attendant must immediately deliver the hair into the chamber and permit the object to feed. During this time, the attendant will sweep the floor clean of shedding using a standard broom and dustpan. Following Incident 337-C, vacuum cleaners are not permitted for use within 15 meters of SCP-337 containment unless specifically authorized. Description SCP-337 is a large conglomeration of human hair, weighing approximately 60 kilograms at last measure. The object's shape and dimensions are tremendously variable. SCP-337 is fully animate, capable of a wide range of locomotion, and can exert force in excess of 18 kilonewtons. It also seems to possess some low level of sentience, although attempts at communication have thus far met with limited success. The object is able to manipulate any hair directly connected to its central mass, with precision down to the individual strand. The method by which SCP-337 mobilizes its components is still under investigation. Analysis of filaments attached to the object has shown them to be identical to regular human hair, and strands that are periodically shed from the object are similarly normal, aside from being drained of pigmentation. Filaments display typical tensile strength and can be easily damaged by fire, blades, or consumer-grade chemical clog remover. Although it displays no obvious sensory organs, SCP-337 is highly aware of its surroundings and may even possess perceptive abilities exceeding those of humans. For the most part, these senses are tuned towards detecting and acquiring its principal form of sustenance. Fresh. Human. Hair. When a human being with any hair measuring longer than 5 centimeters comes within approximately 30 meters of SCP-337, it enters what could be described as a predatory state, rapidly braiding together several dense tendrils of hair in the direction of its prey. The object's range of perception seems to be unhindered by the walls of its containment chamber. The object will then close in on its target at great speed, attempting to overtake and envelop it. When successful, SCP-337 restrains the subject's limbs and begins to harvest all hair of sufficient length from the body. Hair is painlessly removed from the dermis at the base, root included, and is immediately incorporated into the object's mass via knotting or weaving. Patterns of bruising, bleeding, and sebaceous eruption on subjects following feedings suggest follicles are partially loosened from the inner sheath prior to extraction. This appears to sometimes accelerate hair regrowth, even in regions where it is typically stunted. To date, researchers have failed to replicate this effect artificially. While SCP-337 was found in a filthy state at time of recovery, it has since demonstrated a preference for cleanliness. Not long after initial containment, the object managed to escape its temporary enclosure through a narrow, 2 centimeters in diameter, wiring duct. It was discovered on site several hours later in the fourth floor women's washroom, where it emerged from a drain and consumed the hair of two showering researchers. A security team arrived shortly thereafter to find SCP-337 under a running shower tap, lathering itself with shampoo left behind by the women. Once containment was re-established, SCP-337's enclosure was fitted with its present bathing accommodations and a supply of hair conditioning product. The object's rate of shedding has since decreased dramatically. Note: 
SCP-337 may seem to prefer live feedings, but it will still readily consume hair that has already been removed from a human host, provided the follicle is intact and the root has only been detached for a few minutes. We have established a means of accomplishing this extraction just as effectively, if not as painlessly, as the object's method. To limit risk of cross-contamination, Class D personnel should only be exposed to SCP-337 for approved testing purposes. Requests by personnel to be deliberately exposed for feeding are preemptively denied. Dr. Addendum SCP-337 has demonstrated the ability to grow well beyond its present mass through the accumulation of additional hair. It was discovered in the plumbing system of a large nursing home facility in Pennsylvania in 19 after Agent noticed a story entitled Sewer Snakes Scalp Senior Citizens in a local newspaper. A team was dispatched to investigate under the guise of a fumigation contracting company. After evacuating residents to another facility, agents cut off all water and sewage lines in the building, monitoring sink and shower drains for any sign of the object. When a portion of SCP-337 finally emerged, it attempted to couple with Agent R's cranium, only to be intercepted by his weapon's bayonet. The tendril immediately retracted into the drain, after which time the object was not sighted again for more than 45 minutes. Coordinated deployment of chemical clog remover forced the object to exit through pipes in the facility's basement-level utility room, where several agents were on hand to apprehend it with portable flamethrowers. However, the agents were unprepared for the sheer size of the object, which quickly filled the lower level of the building. In the confusion, a sizable portion of SCP-337 was ignited. The resulting blaze spread quickly throughout the facility. Most on the upper floors were able to flee the structure before it collapsed, but several agents did not escape in time. SCP-337 managed to extricate its remaining mass through the building's ventilation system, shedding burning components as it went. When it finally amassed in the facility's parking lot, it was estimated to be over meters tall. Surviving members of the intervention team converged around the object and successfully corralled it within the lot using flame propellant until support arrived. By the time SCP-337 was contained, it had lost more than 90% of its original mass. The fire and subsequent destruction of the nursing home was officially blamed on faulty wiring, and damages were settled out of court. Displaced residents were transferred to a Foundation-operated nursing facility, where amnesiacs were administered as required and data expunged without incident. Incident 337-A Personnel involved Dr. Solomon, D-28803 Date Undisclosed Description 10.26 AM Dr. Solomon and two guards enter antechamber of SCP-337 containment area, escorting D-28803 for scheduled testing. D-28803's hands and ankles are cuffed. He is moderately uncooperative, pleading not to be taken into the chamber. Rumors of a haircut monster are widespread among Class D personnel on site. 10.27 AM Dr. Solomon assures D-28803 that he is completely safe. She firmly reminds him that his cooperation is beneficial to them both. 10.29 AM All personnel enter inner chamber. SCP-337 has already extended several tendrils in direction of D-28803. D-28803 shouts multiple expletives, attempts to move toward exit, is restrained. 10.30 AM SCP-337 closes in on D-28803. D-28803 produces a small pair of shears that had previously been hidden in his waistband. D-28803, still cuffed, rests free from guards, and lunges at SCP-337, screaming. 10.30 AM D-28803 thrusts shears into SCP-337, managing to sever one of the object's tendrils. SCP-337 recoils as if in pain. 10.30 AM SCP-337 envelops D-28803. Dr. Solomon shouts something unintelligible to guards. A muffled cry is heard, followed
followed by a wet sounding thump. 10.31 AM. Guards engage pilot lights of flamethrowers. SCP-337 retreats, disentangling itself from its host. D-28803 collapses to the ground. Body is hairless. Shears are buried up to the handle in the center of D-28803's forehead. Dense hair later discovered in nostrils, trachea, lungs. 10.32 AM. Personnel exit containment chamber with corpse. Incident 337B. Personnel involved. Dr. Here and referred to as Dr. R. Date. Undisclosed. Description. 4.57 PM. Dr. R and two guards enter antechamber of SCP-337 containment area. No D-class personnel are present. Object has refused feeding for two consecutive weeks. SCP-337's former handler, Dr. Solomon, was killed one month prior in an unrelated incident. 4.58 PM. All personnel enter inner chamber. SCP-337 is spread out in a loose pile in center of room, braiding and unbraiding three tendrils. Dr. R approaches object. 4.59 PM. Dr. R extends a large bottle of herbal shampoo toward SCP-337. SCP-337 stops braiding and retracts tendrils into itself. 5 PM. A thick bulb-shaped extrusion of hair emerges at a 45-degree angle from the top of SCP-337. Hair contorts and intertwines on the bulb until detail begins to emerge. 5.01 PM. Dr. R drops the bottle. SCP-337 has produced a crude but recognizable likeness of the late Dr. Solomon. 5.01 PM. Dr. R stumbles back from the object. Both guards rush to support him. SCP-337 turns to follow Dr. R so that the head formation continues to face him. 5.02 PM. The researcher appears severely distraught. She's gone, okay? She's gone. 5.02 PM. Guards attempt to usher Dr. R to the exit. R grabs the handle portion of a guard's flamethrower and directs it at SCP-337. 5.02 PM. Nearest guard punches Dr. R in the jaw. He crumples. Guards restrain the researcher and drag him to the exit. SCP-337 remains still, continuing to direct the head formation toward R. 5.03 PM. All personnel exit containment chamber. The head retracts back into SCP-337, dissolving again into shapeless hair. After a moment, it retrieves the shampoo bottle from the floor and begins to lather itself. Note, this incident is troublesome for a number of reasons. There is no indication that Dr. R was in any way psychically affected by SCP-337, as some have proposed. The man had recently lost a close colleague, and psychiatric analysis after the incident revealed he was much more bereaved about it than he let on. Nevertheless, his reaction to the object's behavior seems illogically severe. It also squandered our first, and so far only, opportunity to engage in communication with the object. We are fortunate that SCP-337 returned to its former behavior patterns not long after the incident. For now, personnel assigned to SCP-337 should undergo periodic psychological evaluation until we know more. I also recommend rotating handlers for the object on a regular basis, so that no one becomes too attached. Dr. B Item Number SCP-352 Object Class Keter Special Containment Procedures Containment area is to remain sealed at all times. No human interaction is allowed with SCP-352. Any and all interaction should be carried out via robot or other remote means. Should human interaction become necessary, full hazmat containment protocols should be observed. In addition, security lines must be attached to all personnel. Should any personnel begin to exhibit erratic behavior, they are to be immediately removed from the containment area via the security lines. 
Any staff reporting hallucinations after interaction with SCP-352 or her hair are to immediately be placed under quarantine. Any staff working in or around the containment area must submit to random psychological and physical testing. Anyone found to be contaminated will be placed into immediate quarantine. Staff attacked by SCP-352 may only be recovered if they have not been bitten by SCP-352. SCP-352 is to be fed only once weekly. Feeding will be discontinued for one month if SCP-352 attacks any personnel. Description SCP-352 appears to be a very old, emaciated woman of indeterminate age and race. SCP-352 speaks Old Russian, but with an accent and dialect that makes translation very difficult. SCP-352 is extremely unwilling to communicate, with most of the conversations thus far made primarily of threats or statements of revenge. SCP-352 has never identified herself by any name, and due to her aggressive nature, it has been impossible to determine any background information. SCP-352 possesses a level of strength and speed much higher than what should be possible for a person of her perceived age and physical dimensions, and has been shown moving loads in excess of 200 kilograms with little physical strain, and moving at speeds in excess of 70 kilometers an hour. SCP-352 can recover from wounds that would be lethal to a human being, including decapitation and disemboweling. This regeneration can take between several days to several weeks, depending on severity. Internally, SCP-352 appears to be a normal human woman, with muscles, bones, and organs in a state consistent with advanced age. Testing done on tissue samples has been inconclusive. SCP-352 is capable of growing very thin, hair-like strands from any part of her body. Apparently, it will. These strands can grow several meters in an hour, and appear to be at least partially under the control of SCP-352. They have been observed crawling along floors and up walls and other structures. These hairs are clear and nearly invisible to the naked eye, and appear to be slightly weaker than standard human hair. The strands are also coated in a thin layer of chemical enzyme, identical to the enzyme in the saliva of SCP-352. SCP-352 produces an enzyme that is most concentrated in the saliva and hair, but is present in all bodily tissues of SCP-352. How it is produced, and its exact chemical makeup, are unknown. This enzyme reacts on contact with human tissue, and rapidly attacks the nervous system. Symptoms manifest almost immediately, and include hallucinations, euphoria, suppression of cognitive or logical thinking, and suppression of pain receptors. This state persists for several days with mild exposure, and can become permanent with high exposure. Bites from SCP-352 lead to high exposure in 99.9% .9 of cases. SCP-352 appears to subsist on a carnivorous diet, with a strong preference for human flesh. SCP-352 will create a web of hair, and wait for prey to become exposed to the enzyme and become more docile. SCP-352 will often remove and eat the limbs of a prey item, to prevent it from wandering away, and can take several days to fully devour prey. Humans have been observed to still be in a euphoric state, and have no knowledge of the outside world, even as they suffer the loss of limbs and other bodily tissue. Addendum Notes on Recovery SCP-352 was recovered in southern Russia, near the town of Reports of an enchanted forest, and a witch who had caused several deaths were initially ignored, until reports of the witch being found and captured began to surface. When Foundation agents responded, the town was found deserted. Several bodies were found in varying states of decomposition, and blood trails appeared to show many more bodies being dragged into the enchanted forest. Recovery teams were dispatched and captured SCP-352, but suffered heavy casualties due to SCP-352's attack and exposure to the enzyme. A large amount of hair was recovered as well, and is believed to be the cause of many exposure incidents, with contact being attributed to spider webs or an agent's own hair 
and not reported until hallucinations manifested. Addendum Notes on Behavior While SCP-352 prefers any type of human flesh over any other type of meat, it appears to have a special propensity for children between 0 and 2 years of age. After observation of highly elevated levels of cooperation, and a reduced tendency to attack staff while consuming flesh of this type, a possible alteration in the current diet is being considered. Addendum The use of SCP-604 and SCP-1680 as a more efficient food source for SCP-352 is currently pending approval from the project director following initial testing. Item Number SCP-359 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures SCP-359 is to be contained within a 30 meter by 30 meter by 30 meter concrete structure. This structure is not to be entered between the hours of 9 p.m. and 6 a.m. local standard time. Any monitoring of SCP-359 during these hours is to be done via security cameras installed within the structure. SCP-359 is to be fed one adult pig every other day. Acceptable substitutions to this diet must be cleared with Agent and Dr. All remnants of SCP-359's prey are to be completely cleaned out of the containment structure by 8.45 p.m. the following day. Description SCP-359 appears to be a metal sculpture of a red-tailed hawk with a wingspan of approximately 4.3 meters perched atop a 12-meter arch. During daylight hours, approximately 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. local standard time, it displays no signs of movement and does not respond to any external stimuli. However, it has been determined by the Foundation that between the hours of 9 p.m. and 6 a.m., it displays the typical behaviors of an adult red-tailed hawk, apart from being nocturnal. SCP-359 is apparently capable of flight. The mechanisms through which it accomplishes this have not been determined, as its wings are too short to allow for flight. SCP-359 was originally located just south of in the United States. It first came to the Foundation's attention when local foresters began finding dead bodies of white-tailed deer, Otocoileus virginianus, in the area within a one-kilometer radius of the sculpture, which looked to have been preyed upon. The white-tailed deer has no natural predators in the state of <laughs> Investigation officially began when motorists on the stretch of state route <laughs> that passes by SCP-359 reported that the hawk was not on top of the arch. On the same day, a local farmer reported finding the sculpture in his field, standing over the body of one of his cows, which had injuries consistent with predation by a large bird of prey. The farmer was administered a Class A amnestic, and fed the story that the cow had died of natural causes and its body eaten by coyotes. Route was closed for repairs, and SCP-359 was transferred to its current containment site and replaced with an immobile replica. Addendum 1 Prior to containment, no evidence existed that SCP-359 had ever attempted to prey on anything besides hoofed mammals. However, since being contained, it has attacked killed, and eaten four D-Class personnel who entered its containment structure during restricted hours. Investigation into the cause of this shift in dietary preferences is ongoing. Item Number SCP-363 Object Class Keter Special Containment Procedures SCP-363 specimens are contained in a 2 meter by 2 meter by 2 meter room that is to be constantly illuminated by high-powered lighting. This lighting must be connected to multiple redundant power sources, and in case of total system failure, Mobile Task Force Ada-7 is to be dispatched to assess the threat. SCP-363 is to be fed 20 lab mice, administered once every 48 hours. Description Ostensibly, SCP-363 are identical to Scolopendra gigantea, or the Amazonian giant centipede. Dietary needs are identical, and DNA inspection has proven no dissimilarities to normal S. gigantea. SCP-363 is, under normal circumstances, the appropriate size for S. gigantea. In darkness, 
Darkness defined here as any level of light under 2 lux, which it actively seeks out, however. SCP-363 will grow rapidly and erratically, to sizes up to and exceeding 10 meters by 2 meters. SCP-363 does not retain the form of a centipede under these conditions. So far, reports have documented proboscises, tentacles, highly elongated mandibles, an inconsistent number of eyes and legs, and, in one case, data expunged. SCP-363 will revert back to normal size and appearance after two to three hours of illumination of a level of at least 50 lux. SCP-363 will attack any animal emitting body heat, and appears to be able to detect and hunt in total darkness. It is assumed it uses other senses to hunt, with vision in a secondary position. Reproductive cycle of SCP-363 is similar to that of normal S. gigantea, with one difference. Rather than in a cluster of leaves and dirt, eggs are laid and fertilized in the cavity of paralyzed data expunged, followed by death. Addendum 1 Note from Dr. Scalder We've determined that fire seems to scare or ward off SCP-363. In light of this, we've equipped three of the members of MTF-807, Creepy Crawlies, with military-issue M2A-17 flamethrowers. Addendum 2 Incident Report of Breach Document Number 363 Alpha Breach 1 Personnel Involved MTF-807 Date 21-5-2003 Location Site Description Attempted retrieval of SCP-363 specimen during power failure slash containment breach. Start of audio log. MTF-807 Commander Johnson. Pertz. Any word from technical on distortion cameras? Contactsman Pertz. No dice, Commander. Complete equipment failure throughout the sector. C. Johnson. All right. Night vision on. Motion sensors go. Fredman, McShawn, Adelaire, report to rendezvous point. Lieutenant McShawn, copy that, Commander. Subteam Hornet coming in. Over. C. Johnson, Subteam Wasp, come in. Radio silence. C. Johnson, Wasp, do you copy? Over. Unknown. Shouting. Jesus Christ Almighty, torch that. Signal cuts out. C. Johnson. Damn it. Oden. Oden, can you hear me? What is your position? Over. Lieutenant Oden. Outside of Lab 8. We found it, sir. It's holed up in there. It got DNA. -in. Over. C. Johnson. Casualty. L. Oden. Mangled leg, sir. We scared the in there with the flamethrower. Don't think it's coming out. Are they fixing the power yet? Over. C. Johnson. Forget about that, Oden. Tell Von Hauer to keep his flamer trained on the door. Hornet, can you hear me? Over. L. McShawn. Loud and clear, sir. C. Johnson. Forget the rendezvous. Relocate to Lab 8. Don't engage yet. Copy. Lieutenant McShawn. Going- Holy f What was that? Adelaire, do you see anything? Over. Flamer Adelaire. Extensive swearing. There's another one of those in here. Second containment breach, Commander. C. Johnson. Has it seen you? Over. F. Adelaire. I don't reckon, sir. C. Johnson. Good. Try to keep it that way. Pertz. How many of those things did they keep in here? C. M. Pertz. Relays question to contact. Eight, sir. C. Johnson. Good God. Okay. Tell him fuck the preservation and detonate the gas charges. C. M. Pertz. They, uh, they can't, sir. C. Johnson. Why the fuck not, Pertz? Data expunged. L. Oden. So we're all fucked three days from Sunday. Good to know. Orders, Commander. C. Johnson. Fuck them all and burn it down, Oden. Tell Von Hauer and Adelaire to set fire to Lab 8, then split up and do a sweep of the area. Neutralize all hostile centipede. 
L. Oden. Copy that. C. Johnson. Pertz. Still no contact with Blackfly? C. M. Pertz. Blackfly, report in. Radio silence. C. M. Pertz. No Blackfly. C. Johnson. I gathered, Pertz. All right. Oden. Status report. Unknown. Gasping. Groaning. C. Johnson. Th who's that? Identify. Unknown. Flamer Tell, sir. C. Johnson. What is your status, Tell? What of Blackfly? Over. F. Tell. Dead. Everyone. C. Johnson. Repeat that, Tell. F. Tell. Screaming. We're all f***ing dead down here, Commander. I saw one of them. One of them pulled Doug apart. Just, just in half. It laid all these eggs. And another one squirted this jizz over them. They hatched. They hatched so fast. More of those things. Ate him so fast. Dozens of them. Eating Howard now. I liked Howard, Commander. Eating him. Eating him. C. Johnson. Calm down, Tell, for God's sake. What's your personal status? F. Tell. They're on my legs. I can see them. But I can't feel it. Biting me. Radio silence. F. Tell. I feel something. Burning. Like bubbling. C. Johnson. Tell. Self-terminate. That's an order. I'm sorry. F. Tell. Unintelligible. C. Johnson. God damn it, Tell. Do you copy? Immediate self-termination. F. Tell. Warped voice. The flesh is like milk to us. C. Johnson. What the hell are you saying, Tell? F. Tell. We are one. C. Johnson. I think he's gone crazy. F. Tell. One is all. Cracking noises. C. Johnson. Wasp. Hornet. Come in. Radio silence. C. Johnson. Wasp. Hornet. Come in, damn it. L. Oden. Same warped voice as documented with Flamer Tell. We are here. There are many. C. Johnson. Pertz. Tell command we're evacuating the premises. Mission failure. C.M. Pertz. Sir, yes, sir. C. Johnson. Airstrike and full bombardment once we're out. Nope. Interrupted by crashing sound. Jesus Christ, what? Tearing sounds. Five minutes of radio silence. C. Johnson presumed dead. Unknown individual. Presumed C.M. Pertz. Here. O oh Israel, YHWH is our God, YHWH alone. Gunshot. End of audio log. Postscript. Site firebombed. Several undamaged and fertilized SCP-363 eggs retrieved. Contained. All members of MTF-807 presumed dead. New team established. O5. Addendum 3. Interview. Interviewed. Janitor R. Interviewer. Data expunged. Referred to as I. Forward. Interview conducted after said janitor professed to a possible SCP sighting after firebombing of sight. Begin log. I. Hello, R. Please sit down. Thank you. Now. You said you saw something after the firebombing. Care to expand on that? Janitor. It was, well, one of those guys from the MTF you had stationed there. Ada 7. One of those guys, yeah. I. Do you know his name, perchance? Janitor. Yeah, yeah. I talked to him once. That guy. Tell. One of the flamers. I. Are you sure it was him? Janitor. No, no, I ain't sure. It, it looked like him, for sure. But there were all these things growing out of him. Like insect legs, but all in random places. From his chest, his arms, and one of them was poking out of his eyeball. 
His eye was just gone. And his mouth, there were these, like, these pinchers. Mandibles. All black. And there were these things. I continue. Janitor. These things. Centipedes. Crawling in and out of holes in his flesh. He looked at me. His one eye had gone all... It looked all like a bug's eye, with facets and stuff. And he laughed. I think he did anyway. I, and then, janitor, he he ran away. I, thank you, and log. Addendum 4, security level 4, announcement. Signal of standard MTF anti-defection tracker located data expunged. 18 miles away from site Signal associated with Tell Tracking procedure initialized Infection risk to be negated at all costs 05 Item number SCP-373 Object class Safe Special containment procedures SCP-373 is to be kept in a containment locker at Site-38 Research into SCP-373 and SCP-373-A iterations is to be carried out by authorized personnel. Grounds for immediate revocations of testing privileges include, but are not limited to, recent loss of loved ones, testing privileges suspended for five years, any history of abuse or inability to follow orders as per containment procedures for other SCPs, testing privileges revoked permanently, any past association with paranormal research or investigative groups. Testing privileges revoked until approval given by site director. Or any unusual or persistent interest or obsession with SCP-373. Testing privileges revoked permanently. Note from head researcher The potential implications of this device for both SCP-373-A entities and their former loved ones require a certain degree of composure with regard to its use. Quite frankly, we may be creating these beings rather than channeling them. Personnel unable to react responsibly with that degree of power are not to be allowed access. Note from head researcher, testing with D-class personnel to be carried out as per addendum 3734. For maximum efficiency in gathering intelligence regarding SCP-373-A entities, all records used with SCP-373 should be 33.5 RPM vinyl albums, with lyric-heavy songs or spoken word tracks, audiobooks, comedy albums, and other principally speech-based records are encouraged. Principally instrumental or orchestral music is forbidden. Description SCP-373 is an antique disc phonograph player. Markings on the machine indicate it was built in 19... An additional label indicates that the device was modified in late 1940 at a facility called Laboratories, Inc. The device is composed of a crank-operated turntable embedded in a wooden case, a tone arm with an aluminum stylus, and a slightly tarnished silver horn. SCP-373 appears to have the ability to modify the audio of any record player on it according to particular patterns. Specifically, Research has demonstrated that approximately every fourth word or phrase will be altered from the originally recorded song or monologue. These new words can be organized sequentially to reveal what appear to be messages or statements from a series of unknown entities. These entities have been named SCP-373-AX, with X to be replaced with a numerical identification as entities are discovered. The entity is able to communicate for the duration of each instance of the playing of the record. Upon the next playing of the same record, the same entity will be speaking, but will claim not to recall the previous conversation. Due to the stilted nature of the communication, it is rare for the entities to communicate any significant amount of information to Foundation researchers before the end of the record. However, research has demonstrated that two-way communication is possible by lifting the needle from the record while it spins and speaking into the horn. Any attempt at useful communication requires both parties speak while the record spins at the speed at which optimal playback was intended. All SCP-373-A entities report that speaking into the horn with the record slowed or stopped 
results in a high-pitched squeal for the entity, and vice versa. Testing with anomalies such as SCP-043 and SCP-1668 did not initially produce data. However, analysis of audio taken during testing has shown the presence of at least two distinct breathing patterns being broadcast from SCP-373. Further scheduled testing is currently under consideration. Addendum 3731 Abridged Log of SCP-373-A Entities Entity SCP-373-A-3 Run-Through Number 1 Record Painkiller by Judas Priest Notes An early attempt at scientific analysis of the phenomenon. Both the choice of music and questions were largely arbitrary. Two-way communication not yet understood. Full lyrical output is included below to demonstrate effect. All future entries will include only relevant utterances. Results Playing of Track 1, Painkiller, resulted in the following lyrical output. Faster than a hello, terrifying scream. Enraged hello, full of anger. Who's half man and there, machine. Rides the metal can, breathing smoke and anybody. Closing in with here, soaring high. He is me, painkiller. This is is painkiller. Planets devastated. Mankind's this. It's knees. A savior what? From out the skies. Hell, answer to there is. Through boiling clouds, I thunder. Blasting bolts don't steal. Evil's going under, no, wheels. He is what? Painkiller. This is I've painkiller. Faster than a dun, bullet. Louder than an please, bomb. Chromium plated, it's metal. Brighter than a so, suns. Flying high on dark. Stronger free and and. Never more encaptured. Cold. Been brought back here, the grave. Entity. SCP-373-A3. Run through. Eight. Record. Painkiller by Judas Priest. Notes. First consistent and notable demonstration of two-way communicative potential. Communication redacted to relevant utterances for convenience. Result. The following interview was carried out by researcher Kim with entity SCP-373-A3. Kim. Speaking as record begins. Needle up. Hello. Please try to stay calm. You've had an accident, and we are working to save you. Can you tell us your name? SCP-373-A3. Hello. Oh, thank goodness. I thought I had died. Kim, could you please tell us your name? SCP-373-A3. My name is Mary Turner. I had a dream. I thought they hanged. Kim, you're okay, Mary. Can you tell me what you see? SCP-373-A3. All dark. No light. Just your voice. Please help. Kim, we're very close to getting you out. Just hold on tight. Can you tell me where you live and what day it is? SCP-373-A3. Valdosta in Folsom County. Is my baby okay? Kim, it's fine, ma'am. Can you tell me what year it is? SCP-373-A3. What you mean? It's 1918. The record ends. Flipping the record results in the conversation beginning again, as in all other tests. Entity number. SCP-373-A24. Run through. Two. Record. Item Pi 2. Notes. Item Pi 2 is a vinyl record pressed by Site 38 for testing purposes, consisting of a rapid, though clearly audible, reading of Charles Dickens' A Tale of Two Cities. The speed at which the book is read allows for approximately 720 words per minute, increasing the potential conversational ability of the ensuing SCP-373-A entity. Result. 
The following is the interview between researcher Kim and SCP-373-A24. Kim, hello. There's been an accident. We're trying to get you out, but we need you to remain calm. Can you tell us what the last thing is that you remember? SCP-373-A24. Harry, is that you? Kim, I'm sorry. I can't understand you. What is the last thing you were doing? SCP-373-A24. Harry, it's me. It's Susan. The car skidded on the ice. Where are you? Kim, appearing distressed. Wait, Susan? Susan? Oh my god, Susan. Are you in here? Assistant Researcher Lucas. Harry, we can't tell them. Kim, that's her, Joey. That's my wife in there. To SCP-373. Sweetie, it's me. Oh god, you've been gone for almost a year, but you're back now. Lucas. Security, we need security in here. He's losing it. Attempts to restrain researcher Kim. Kim, knocking down Lucas, grabbing SCP-373's horn, shaking. I'm going to get you out of there. Just wait. Several agents enter the room and drag researcher Kim out by force, knocking SCP-373 to the ground in the process. Experiment ends. Damage to SCP-373 repaired. Researcher Lucas's injuries were treated. Researcher Kim's attack against Foundation agents attempting to restrain him led to his termination. Addendum 3732 SCP-373 entities have been showing a greater tendency to present themselves as relatives or close friends of Foundation personnel in the last two months. This has begun to take place in spite of deliberate efforts to choose records at random. Statistical probability suggests it to be highly unlikely that we have been selecting these particular individuals without some influence on the part of SCP-373, requesting a halt to testing until a pattern can be discerned. Researcher Lucas Addendum 3733 Request approved Head Researcher Addendum 3734 Four different researchers have been caught over the last three weeks attempting to access SCP-373 for personal purposes. In one instance, a researcher successfully began to use a record already believed to contain one SCP-373-A entity, at which point he was able to communicate with his deceased daughter. Present opinion among Site-38 Command is that SCP-373 is deliberately manipulating its users into emotional distress. Additionally, given the disregard for security protocols being shown now by experienced Foundation researchers, in the face of SCP-373, we are forced to conclude that the object becomes increasingly determined to force individuals to use it as time passes between usage, much in the way predators become increasingly desperate as time passes after feeding. Suggesting that D-Class personnel be allowed to use SCP-373 twice weekly in order to prevent further deterioration of conditions here. Researcher Lucas Addendum 3735 Request approved Head Researcher Item Number SCP-382 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures SCP-382-1 is to be stored in a standard site containment room inside a 1.5 by 1.5 by 1.5 meter plexiglass box of 5 centimeter thickness, at minimum. A video camera is to be kept trained on it at all times, though this is merely for observational purposes. Due to the area of influence and deleterious nature of SCP-382's effect, it should only be removed from its enclosure for testing purposes, with staff observing from a remote location. No personnel, Class D or otherwise, should interact with SCP-3821 for more than two hours, unless accompanied by at least one armed agent. Description In its inactive state, SCP-3821 is a large baby carriage, manufactured in 19 by in England. Its age shows. Metal components are heavily rusted, the rubber of the tires is brittle, and the cushion 
is missing. SCP-3822 appears to be an infant, months old, extremely emaciated, with several injuries that seem to vary with each manifestation. On different occasions, SCP-3822 has shown heavy bruising, broken bones, and sometimes data expunged, despite which 3822 could still make vocalizations, although it is unknown how this was possible. When SCP-3821 is not being interacted with, SCP-3822 manifests every to minutes, staying between and minutes. However, when a person places their hands on the handlebars of the carriage, 3822 will instantly manifest, and the period of time of both disappearance and reappearance will decrease to approximately one second. Any person who makes visual contact with SCP-3821, from now on referred to as the subject, is compelled to approach it and place their hands on its handlebar. While manifesting only intermittently, SCP-3822 appears to compound the effect when the subject sees it. This effect does not transmit through video feeds, transparent objects, or anything else that would separate SCP-3821 and its victim. And once the subject is in contact with SCP-3821, no one else will be influenced until the subject has died and SCP-382 has reset. As soon as the subject comes into physical contact with SCP-3821 and SCP-3822 has manifested, they appear to enter a trance, in which they will propel SCP-3821 in a small circle and make noises directed at SCP-3822, apparently intended to be soothing. As time passes, the subject will begin to weaken and their body will begin to degrade, while SCP-3821 slowly begins to take on a new, shinier appearance. Rust will begin to flake off, revealing shiny metal underneath. The rubber wheels will become more supple, and a velvet cushion will appear inside. At the same time, each successive manifestation of SCP-3822 will appear with fewer and fewer injuries, while looking less and less emaciated. The subject will continue to interact with SCP-382 up until just under two hours, at which point they will perish due to massive widespread organ failure. Once the subject has perished, SCP-3822 will disappear, and SCP-3821 will return to its former, derelict appearance within 30 minutes. Addendum 382A On Date Expunged my research team and I began testing to determine whether a person of sufficient youth and physical fitness could sustain interaction with SCP-382 past the two-hour mark. D-382-GTF-87I was chosen for his age, and because he had been a physical trainer prior to Data Expunged, and kept in shape throughout his incarceration at his exposure to SCP-382 proceeded as normal, though the physical degradation appeared to progress at a slower rate than previous test subjects. After the two-hour mark, with D-382-GTF-87I still living, though in extremely poor condition, SCP-3822 manifested as usual, but did not disappear one second later. SCP-3822 then data expunged, consuming the then mummified corpse of D-382-GTF-87I, and proceeded to data expunged. Fortunately, only one other Class D was killed before SCP-3822 was terminated by Agent But the event has necessitated the amending of the SCP-3822 Special Containment Procedure somewhat. I don't feel that this warrants a change in classification level. Doctor Lesson complete. To continue with your orientation training, subscribe to SCP Orientation right now and make sure you don't miss any of our upcoming videos.